Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Today we're here with Robert Sams, uh, so it's, it's kind of timely that he's on with us because uh, I think we've been wanting to have him on for a bit. Actually, originally I think perhaps it did come from reading one of Vitalik's blog posts where he was talking about the idea of a stable cryptocurrency. Uh, and then we had uh, Rob scheduled for for today for a while, and then when we had Vitalik on two weeks ago, uh, it, this topic came up again. Uh, so it's it's very timely that he's on. And uh, thanks to Robert for joining us today. Glad to be here. Um, so perhaps uh, let's get started by uh, you can introduce yourself briefly, talk a bit about um, your background and uh, how you became interested in cryptocurrencies. Uh, sure. Um, my my background is uh, from the the world of uh, finance. Um, uh, I've been a, a short term interest rate derivatives trader in the hedge fund world for over a decade. Um, the guy basically trading central bank policy, and um, uh, but I've been interested in alternative forms of money and um, uh, cryptocurrency for uh, for a long time, uh, really since the, the late nineties when. I learned about um, uh, David Chalm's DigiCash, uh, so it's um, it's been a labor of love for me for a long time, both both the technology uh, and and uh, questions of, of monetary theory. Yeah, so you're really uh, one of those who have been interested in the topic even before Bitcoin, which uh, and there's not many of them, but it still seems like uh, yeah, that DigiCash had did have quite a mind share at the time. Yeah, it, it it did, and and things uh, fizzled out um, around the turn of the century. But you know, there, there there's always been this uh, this uh, rump of people um, from various backgrounds, uh, you know, who've uh, thought a lot about money, um, the nature of money, and uh, you know, speculating on on ways we can improve upon what we've got. So it's 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 an old uh, it's it's an old theme. <laughs> it's been around for a, a long time. And so, when did you start getting involved specifically with Bitcoin? Uh, I mean, because since you were working with hedge funds. Yeah, I, I mean, I I found out about it in <clears throat> early um, 20, 2011, um, and was uh, yeah pretty blown away um, by Satoshi's paper and the solution to the double spending problem, uh, which I thought was brilliant. And uh, and I've been following it, um, you know, ever since, uh, you know, more as a labor of love uh, than uh, than anything. Uh, only recently, um, uh, this last year, uh, um, have I started to get involved in the space uh, commercially. Uh, but. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I guess I've, I've been following Bitcoin for um, you know for for quite a while, an early adopter. Um, so and probably an, an early critic as well. <laughs> <laughs> an, an early adopter and early critic. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the interesting things. Um, is I have become uh, grown sort of consistently more uh, critical and skeptical about Bitcoin uh, the, the longer I've been with it. It's, it's very interesting. You know? I think I, I recently saw a brief interview with Mike Hearn and, and we had him on quite a, a long time ago where he uh, addressed some of the same criticisms but um, he was also it's like he described Bitcoin as this extremely fragile thing that like could be broken so easily and, uh, and then at the same time there are a lot of people, of course, who believe like you know this is the next thing, right? It's going to take over the world. Everybody's going to be using Bitcoin twenty years from now, and uh, it's quite it's quite interesting how you can sort of progressively become more skeptical, but also be really invested in the idea of a decentralized money. Mm, I think the term I think using the term Bitcoin is also a little bit loaded. You know, people will will say Bitcoin is the future, but I think what they mean by that is. Cryptocurrency is the future, but well, it depends, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people think Bitcoin is the future, right? Bitcoin will be the one, but yeah, um, yeah. There, there, I mean, there is a view that yeah, I, I think um, 
Vitalik dis- has described it as Bitcoin maximalism. You know that mm-hmm. <laughs> that it's it's Bitcoin or bust, and that the you know, Bitcoin protocol, you know, laid down by Satoshi is you know like uh, some form of revealed religion. <laughs> um, you know, whereas I, I think you know the um, the Bitcoin protocol was uh, a brilliant synthesis of um, you know several different ideas uh, that have been kicking around for a while. You know, Adam Back's hash cash, um, you know, use of public key signatures for um, uh, signing transactions, um, and it was it was a it was a brilliant solution to um, uh, to a problem that people have been grappling with for a long time, uh, but. Uh, it's it's still very early days. You know, there's no reason to think that um, you know the first protocol that gets any any that solves the double spending problem in, in a totally decentralized way and gets traction is going to be the you know the thing that that lasts forever. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, to sort of lead into our, our main topic, uh, I just want to read out a quote from from your paper, which I think really uh, sums up well the the idea behind what we're talking about today. So this is, if a cryptocurrency system aims to be a general medium of exchange, deterministic coin supply is a bug rather than a feature. Um, so uh, can you explain to people um, what you mean with the statement? And uh, I mean, I, I, I thought this is the sort of core idea that underlies, uh, underlies what you've described there and, and the work you've done there. Yeah, sure. OK. So. Um... Fixed coin supply is a bug rather than a feature. I mean, what I mean by that is, you know, if if the goal is to create something that's a general medium of exchange, um, the goal really needs to be to uh, have a coin whose value is stable, because that's why you know a you know a fiat currency is is valuable. Is that um, uh, you know it's a decent store of value for the short period of time in which you hold you know the balance. Um, and uh, if you have um, a fixed coin supply, you will never get um, uh, uh, stability in the purchasing power of the coin. And it's um, it's a problem because, on the one hand, you want the coin to you know be adopted, um, you know, so you you know you want the de- you know, in the early days of a of a cryptocurrency, if it's um, you know if it starts to gain traction, you should expect you know coin demand to to increase you know dramatically. It's like hyperbolic growth, um, but the mere expectation of that growth creates a separate type of demand, you know, speculative demand that anticipates you know future transactional demand, and um, and that is what generates uh, that speculative demand is what uh, is what generates the, the the volatility but the volatility itself is the very thing that chases away um, the demand from people who want to use it as a medium of exchange so you, you get this paradoxical um, uh, you know uh, consequence that uh, the very optimism that in future the coin is going to be adopted by a lot of people is actually what stands in the way from it being adopted in the first place, and I and I think you you know I, I think this has been you know empirically borne out um, you know with Bitcoin and that in terms of um, you know transaction volume, people actually using uh, Bitcoin for um, you know as a general medium of exchange, it's you know, the the growth rate is is positive, but it's 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 nothing, it's not what you'd expect from you know, something that's going to um, you know going to grow at a rapid pace or, you know, take over Visa PayPal or the U.S. dollar or, you know, or whatever the end game is that, uh, that, that we want this thing to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, of course, what you also imply with this, and, and th- I guess that's a, it's a point where views sort of diverge, is that Bitcoin will never be stable, right? Because a lot of people do think, uh, and, and I personally don't share that opinion, that Bitcoin is becoming more stable and less volatile over time, and that sort of as more people adopted, uh, yeah. it will. Uh, it no, it, it, empirically, it's just wrong. You know, um, Bitcoin volatility hasn't hasn't uh, declined. 
Uh, I mean, you get periods, you know, where volatility declines and then it spikes again, um, you know, which is what you see in really any financial time series. You know, this is high correlation, serial correlation, you know, in, in volatility. High volatility periods you know, beget more high volatility and low volatility periods tend to beget lower volatility. But the, the, the overall trend line um, uh, is, um, is, is pretty stable. Um, and uh, you know, so so we're not seeing a decline in volatility now. What about the forecast? Okay, you know, will you know volatility decline? Um, I don't think there is any reason to think that it will, um, because because supply is fixed. Um, the only way that you'll get you know, stable you know volatility in something like Bitcoin is if uh, demand starts to grow at some predictable rate. And that's not something that you can expect to, you know, to happen, you know, at all um, until until the end game is, you know, is won and you know Bitcoin has found its niche uh, as whatever it is, you know, um, taking over the U.S. dollar or you know, you know, what, you know what, what, whatever the end game is, there will always be uncertainty, you know, about uh, the you know the the growth rate of of demand, and as long as that uncertainty is there, the volatility will be there. You know, there's another argument that that I hear a lot. You know, which is that the volatility in Bitcoin is due to you know um, liquidity, and once liquidity increases, um, uh, you know, vol in, um, volatility will decline. And again, it's really a misdiagnosis of of the source of volatility. The source of the volatility is this mismatch between an uncertain demand and a fixed supply, um, and liquidity. You know, yeah, low levels of liquidity do create volatility, but it's uh, like a it's it's there there is a point at which any increase in liquidity actually doesn't decrease volatility and as we find in 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 um, empirical evidence in financial markets is that uh, you know once you get a sufficient level of liquidity if there's any correlation between any you know further increases in liquidity it's that greater liquidity actually increases volatility because it increases trading volumes and increases speculative activity in the financial assets. So, um, you know, there's so even outside of the cryptocurrency space that that thesis that uh, you know more and more liquidity, you know, lowers lowers volatility is um, uh, is is just not not correct. And I think I think you're t totally correct. And even even if you imagine that scenario, right, where Bitcoin takes over the world, etc. Uh, like, the, first of all, that's a long way to go. And second of all. Even psychologically, right? You, you have this this mechanism that you want to be uh, in there before other people, and it has this sort of. Um, I think it's absolutely prone uh, to speculative bubbles because of that, right? Because there's, if you anticipate other people coming in, you want to be in first, uh, and then it creates this rush into it that's really not backed by, like, let's say with a stock, right? With a stock, you have earnings, and they sort of are something to tie the price of the stock to. Uh, but with Bitcoin, that's not really the case, right? Like it can be anything the Bitcoin price, as long as uh, you know there's supply and demand for it. That's fine, right? So. Well, I mean, I, I think the sort of you know view of Bitcoin as a as a growth stock, like in 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 one sense, is correct because you know if uh, you know if the optimistic thesis did materialize that this became a widely used medium of exchange, then then demand for the coin is going to increase a lot. Um, and, and you know, and that's what drives the, the speculative demand. But where it's not like a growth stock, and this is really important, is that the you know the the, the earnings and sales of a of a growing company um, uh, aren't influenced by its share price. You know, exactly, it's yeah. uh, and with something like Bitcoin, obviously, is you know the the the, the demand to use the coin as a medium of ex as a medium of exchange is influenced by the volatility um, of it. So, you get this um, you know self defeating prophecy um, you know where where by the very optimism uh, um, that the that the coin is going to take off actually undermines undermines it and keeps that keeps that from happening. Uh, at least that, I mean that that's that's my conjecture and uh, and I, I think it, it's it's to date been borne out in um, you know in, in the evidence. Um, now, the, the, now there in, in terms of criticism of so we'll get to stable coins in, in a second, but you know there is this fundamental idea that um, in the Bitcoin space that the Bitcoin supply should be de deterministic, that it should be fixed. Uh, 
what and, and so what do you think fuels that? Is I mean, is it sort of this sort of libertarian idea that um, that uh, only uh, markets can de de determine uh, the supply and demand of a currency? I mean, what, what, why do you think there is such a resistance to the to the idea yeah. of, a, of a stable um, cryptocurrency that is not um, uh, deterministic in its supply? Yeah. Okay. I mean. I think first of all, in this space, like you, you, you do have people with different, um, you know, philosophical um, motivations or perspectives, you know. And you know, on on the one hand, there's the decentralization idea, you know, to have you know a um, a you know a decentralized ledger that doesn't rely on a trusted third party, um, uh, it, you know, is is a really interesting thing, and to put an alternative form of money on such a ledger, well, you know, it, it, it now seems quite plausible that we can make, you know, um, you know, alternative money something that can exist even in a hostile political environment. Um, so there's that side, but then there's the other side of, um, you know, the yeah, you get the the, the you know gold bugs, um, commodity money people. And they've been around, you know, for a, a long time, um, and 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 they're part of the space as well. And of course, you know, you can have people who believe in both. Um, you know, I'm very much in the first camp, and and not in in the second. So the question is, you know, why do people find this, you know, fixed supply thing so compelling? I think one reason is, um, you know, there there are you know, libertarian monetary types uh, who um, uh, believe that the only form of money that is any good in the long run is uh, is some commodity-based money like a gold standard. And they, you know, wrongly think that Bitcoin is like digital gold. I say they wrongly think that because um, one, uh, even a commodity money or something like a gold standard um, uh, isn't based on a fixed supply. You know, I mean, they're you know, there are gold deposits deep in the ground. Uh, if the price of gold, you know, hovers above the marginal cost of pulling it out of the ground, then uh, gold supply will increase. So even something like gold has um, a somewhat elastic supply function, um, which, you know, and Bitcoin is quite unique in not having, uh, um, uh, having a supply function that doesn't respond to market forces in the outside world at all. Um, so it's not really like digital gold. It's more like a you know a digital collectible, you know, like a digital Rembrandt or something. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, and um, and the and the other um, you know the other thing is that commodity money advocates, gold standard advocates, um, often don't pay enough attention to the institutional reality of gold standards that we've had in the past. You know, so you know, you know people will cite. The you know experience in the 19th century, Europe and the United States, um, you know, being on a gold standard, uh, and it was a period of uh, of you know of of substantial economic growth, but um, you know that wasn't a gold standard in the way that a cryptocurrency would be a gold standard because it's still based on fractional reserve banking. So the actual money supply, um, you know, when when we had a gold standard, um, wasn't fixed. It was it was based on the extension of, of, of credit by the banking system, and it's just that the the base money um, uh, that you know the scripts you know paper were convertible into, um, you know, was a gold standard. But the actual stuff that circulated as a medium of exchange, um, you know, it's not like gold coins. You know, but a but a cryptocurrency, you know, is like gold coins because it's not based on it's not based on on credit or or, or fractional reserve. So I I, I think I, I, so it's a long answer to you know to, to the question. Mm. I think a lot no, of but I, I think there is sort of this misquoting history that often happens when uh, that often happens in this community, but you know, in a lot of different communities as well. And I've I've also called Bitcoin digital gold without really knowing or without really sort of trying to grasp what that meant. Um, and uh, but yeah, I, I, you know when people cite uh, you know the 1900s and and how we were you know on the gold standard then and we had such economic growth, you know, also forgetting perhaps. Other external factors, like uh, I don't know, the invention of uh, of, uh, of uh, steam motors and things like that. You know, there are, are, are potentially other factors that were 
part yeah, of that growth, no. not just the fact we're a gold standard. I, I mean, if, if I can add something, I, I think one reason may also be, I, I think if people actually understood uh, your senior rich idea, and, and we'll get to this in a second, I think they would probably be a lot more open to it. But I think in Bitcoin, the idea of being independent of the central bank, having this independent money is, is central, right? This decentral money, that's the sort of a central idea. Um, and it, it's sort of very obvious that if you say, okay, the supply is going to be uh, growing at this fixed rate, it's very obvious that like nobody can corrupt this. So I think the very idea of having some sort of adjusting money supply, it, it like makes people insecure, right? It's like, oh, but then maybe this isn't so incorruptible anymore. Maybe this, I, I think th there's also a fear there that maybe it's slightly misguided, but that, that the idea of, of decentralized money is very closely linked to having a fixed uh, money supply that sort of everybody can understand. Yeah, yeah, no, sure. I mean, uh, and it's uh, um, uh, having a very, you know, having a supply function, uh, cryptocurrency supply function that's variable and is based on information that comes from outside the system. Um, you know, introduces uh, other sorts of potential problems. Um, so we can talk about that in a minute. You know, and how how to solve those problems. But, um, uh, but. Nonetheless, any any cryptocurrency or any type of currency has a monetary policy. You know whether there's a central bank or not. You know a, a gold standard has a monetary policy. You know it's a monetary policy that's that's determined by the um, you know the, the 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 physics and the cost of pulling gold out of the ground. Um, uh, and and Bitcoin has a monetary policy. I just don't think it's a particularly good one. Um, and you know we have. You know, we we have choices about how we want that supply function to look. You know, we can stick with a deterministic supply function and cap supply. We can have a deterministic supply function that uh, that that grows forever, um, or we can have a non-deterministic supply function that takes you know information from from the outside world. Uh, and and those things are all up 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 for uh, de, you know debate. Um, but what I would like to see is more people actually think critically about how the coin supply. Um, Happens you know, rather than think that there's something intrinsically good about uh, having a having a cap supply. Right. Let's not make assumptions. Let's think critically about things. Um, <laughs> so yeah, let's 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 go into the sort of the main challenges. Like you outline uh, two uh, two problems or two uh, things that need to be accomplished and solved uh, to make uh, a stable cryptocurrency possible. Uh, can you briefly outline those? Sure. I mean, I think there are two there there are two hard problems that have to be solved. Um, uh, and you know the the, the first is uh, if we're going to make a supply function that responds to demand, we need to take information um, about you know market information about the world outside the blockchain uh, and put that. Into the blockchain in a, in a trust minimized way, you know that doesn't bring back you know some trusted trusted third party, and um, and that's one hard problem to solve. Um, you know there there are uh, a couple of different um, strategies for solving that problem, uh, which I can talk about in a minute. Um, and the the other hard problem is uh, how do we distribute the change in supply? So you know, if we're going to have periods, or sometimes the supply needs to increase by X, and sometimes it needs to decrease by Y, um, how how does that coin supply get get distributed? And you know, there are some obvious answers. Well, you know, let's just distribute them to um, uh, you know wallet balances pro rata, you know, for example. Um, but the how you distribute that coin supply um, has ramifications about. Um, how it influences coin demand, and you can reintroduce the same problems that you have with fixed, um, uh, with you know, with fixed money supply um, if if you don't do the distribution right. So that's the second. So the distribution problem is 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 the second one, uh, and and in the Shane shares paper, um, uh, I, I outlined a solution to uh, to the second problem, uh, um, and only kind of sketched upon different strategies for um, tackling the uh, the first problem, which I which I think is the the harder of the t harder of the two problems to solve. Yeah, I, I 
I agree. I think that the price one is, is particularly challenging, right? But uh, what's nice is that you seem to find a solution that's that's really neat, right? That that like really accomplishes. Um, it seems to me everything that needs to be accomplished for the second one, which is like how do you actually uh, keep your price stable uh, in the face of increasing and decreasing demand. I mean, in the beginning it sort of seemed like, oh, if you know the price to me, before I ever like properly thought about this, uh, it was like, oh, if you know the price, then that's simple, right? You just increase it. And, and I didn't even think of, oh, but what happens if the demand decreases, right? It's not so simple. Um, and of course, the problem is then if you decrease the balances, well, it may hold the price stable. But now, if you had uh, you know a hundred coins in your wallet, and a week from now you have only ninety coins in your wallet, uh, well, my, maybe those have the same uh, the same you know sort of real value one coin. But of course, you've still lost purchasing power. Yeah. So that's not something that's p- going to be palatable. Uh, to so, anyone. So, so, so for for example, uh, you know, because the, yeah, the 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 ideal of a stable coin has um, you know been pursued um, by um, by quite a few different people, uh, and there and there are you know several solutions that have been been proposed, um, uh, and the, um, the the w- one of the ones that uh, that I came across um, earlier this year was um, Fernando Amitrano's um, Hayek money idea, and, um, and 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 Hayek money proposes distributing the changes in coin supply pro rata, um, you know, over over coin balances, um, and it's a it, quite an an elegant solution that was outlined in the Hayek money paper, but I I still think it ultimately fails, and if you if you look at um, and we're talking about the now the second problem. How do you distribute the coin supply? Well, if 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 we if we distribute changes in coin supply pro rata all the coin balances, you know, so basically we set up a system whereby say you know the coin price goes up ten percent, then we increase coin supply by ten percent, and everyone's wallet you know nominal coin you know quantity in everyone's wallet goes up by ten percent. We basically just recreated the same um, volatility. Dynamic of purchasing, like of the purchasing power of a wallet, is just like the purchasing power of a Bitcoin wallet. It's just that the nominal quantity of coins changes instead of the market price of the coin. Um, but you still, you still have the the same the same problem. So you need to have a solution to how the the change in the coin supply is, um, yeah. is distributed. I mean, of course, nobody's going to complain, right? In that case, it, it's probably. Um, I mean, I don't know if that could cause problems somewhere as well. Perhaps it could. But uh, the the much more uh, I think the case where it really becomes clear that this is not a good solution is in, in the other case, right? When the when the, the mass decreases, decline, yeah, yeah. Like you know, yesterday you had a hundred coins in your wallet, and today you have you know ninety. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's yeah, it, it's it's that change in the purchasing power that's. Um, the thing that you 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 want to stabilize, not just the the, the market price of, of the and, coin. And psychologically, that's going even going to be much harder sell than with Bitcoin. You know, you can say like, okay, it's worthless, but it feels like, oh, people took away some of my money. Like that's going to be impossible, I think, to sell uh, to people. Yeah, th- that's that, that's an interesting one. Yeah, and, and no, I, I I think it I think it's true. You know, why it's true is is interesting because. You know, economically, they're the same thing. You know, um, uh, but uh, but people tend to view you know price change differently from you know nominal quantity change, and uh, the, you know the the reasons for that are separate question altogether. But um, yeah. but yeah, no, I, I I agree with you. I I think that's that's true. Okay, so we'll get to talk about uh, all that in just a minute. But first, we'll just uh, talk about shape shift. Our sponsor. So, if you ever tried to buy altcoins, you know that it is a very cumbersome process. You have to find a reputable exchange. You have to create an account there. Probably give them a bunch of personal information. Uh, submit an order. Wait for the order to be fulfilled, and that can take a lot of time. And it's just a hassle. And we expect that once you're in the cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem, once you've bought bitcoins, and that you know you're kind of in the system, uh, that well. You know, getting one type of coin or another should be 
should be easy, right? There, are, there shouldn't be these, these barriers. Uh, but that's not always the case until now, because we have Shapeshift. So Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to buy and sell altcoins. They support Litecoin, uh, Peercoin. I have to check because they add new coins all the time. So Litecoin, Peercoin, Darkcoin, Dogecoin, Namecoin, Feathercoin, Blackcoin. Bitcoin Dark, Quark, Redcoin, and they have this new one uh, since last week, New Bits. Some of these I don't even I don't even know, and they're adding new coins all the time. You know, at some point they start they may start have, uh, allowing you to get uh, Ether or Gems or some other app coins. And so uh, let's show you how this works. So it's it's pretty it's pretty easy to use. Uh, I like to think of it as uh, Google Translate for cryptocurrencies. Uh, for some reason, my screen share is not working again this week. <laughs> Wait, I will do it. Here, let, uh, Ryan, can you do it? Yeah. Wait, where is the screen share? Uh, just one second. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, basically how this works, uh, you go on shapeshift.io, and you don't have to create an account. You just uh, see this um, really cool interface. On one side, they've got the currency that you want to deposit, and on the other side they've got the currency you want to receive. There we go. And uh, basically, you just add... Um, so let's, let's, let's just do this very briefly. So yeah. let's say uh, you want to do Bitcoin and Litecoin. Let's say we want to purchase uh, five Litecoins. Now, we do need to enter addresses. Actually, I don't have a Litecoin address ready. Do you have one? Yeah, here we go. There's one for you. Let's see how quick we can do this. Uh, and start. And now I can do this with my phone. So I think this would be even quicker. I've already done it. Ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> okay. Oh, actually, I don't have enough coins in my wallet. <laughs> Okay. So for those of you listening here, we see on the screen the deposit address and uh, the amount to send and a QR code. And as soon as this Brian, there we go. So Brian just flashed it. It said awaiting exchange. And in just a few seconds, he'll get the Litecoin sent to his account. No, to yours. Oh, to mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for okay. liking right? <laughs> so this should just take a second. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to check out Shapeshift, you can do so at shapeshift.io. Um, it's yeah, super convenient. One one thing that's also nice is let's say you hold your money in Dogecoin and now it's complete, uh, and like you want to pay something in Bitcoin and let's say they gave you a Bitcoin address, you can essentially pay uh, pay with Dogecoin if you use their browser extension, which is really cool. Um, let, let, maybe we demonstrate that next time. Yeah, uh, check out the browser extension. It's called Shapeshift Lens. You can find it in the Chrome App Store if you're using Chrome. So yeah, Shapeshift is the fastest and easy way to buy and sell altcoins, uh, and uh, you don't need to send any personal information. Like you just saw, it takes about uh, 30 seconds to to trade any type of uh, altcoins that they support, and your privacy is protected. So head over to Shapeshift.io, give it a try, and tell us what you think. And we'd like to thank them for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Okay, so getting back to senior shares. Um, you outline sort of two different type of coins, right? Because uh, you don't just have one, you know, the, the sort of the stable cryptocurrency in, in your model has consists of, you could say, two different components where you call one a coin and the other one share. Um, can you explain briefly how they work and what role they play? Sure. Um, so the coins are um, what happens a variable supply, that's the thing that you're trying to, to, to stabilize. And, uh, and you change the supply in coins by um, auctioning off new coins versus shares or new shares versus coins. So for example, if you need to increase the coin supply, 
um, by 10%, you have a blockchain auction um, that auctions 10% 10, um, 10 new, um, uh, new coins um, against, um, uh, against shares, so effectively increasing the coin supply and decreasing the share supply. And vice versa, if you need to um, to decrease um, the uh, um, the coin supply, um, you'll you'll be um, selling coins versus buying new um, shares um, on in in the auction. Um, and in if the long run, you know, if 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 the coin is worth anything, if it if it has any um, any um, any any um, positive you know growth rate in its adoption. Um, you'd expect the coin supply to um, to increase on average over time, which means that the share supply is going to decrease on average over time. And there's an argument that I uh, outline in the paper um, that the this um, uh, this change in coin supply effectively translates into um, uh, the, the 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 share coins being uh, like an income generating um, asset. Um, you know, it's 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 like a dividend paying stock. Um, you can you can replicate your position in shares in such a way that um, you you are effectively receiving or paying a dividend that's equal to the change in 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 coin supply. So it it it, it recreates this 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 logic that you know that we um, sort of want uh, you know to encourage early adoption and um, and. People who want to speculate on the future prospects of the coin, um, but we 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 break the speculative de <clears throat> speculative demand and transaction demand basically into two separate objects. If you want to speculate on the future adoption of the stable coin, you you buy shares, and if you want to just use the coin, um, carry balances around to make uh, to facilitate your transactions, then then you then you buy coin. So uh, also, what one should mention, right? If you let's say the demand increases and there's an auction of coins, then the shares used to purchase those coins are destroyed. That's right? correct. So, um, and of course, the the so consequence of this is if if it works out, you would expect that if you hold a certain amount of shares, uh, the number of coins you're able to purchase with those shares will will increase over time, right? If the if the currency is successful. As, yeah. as there will be fewer and fewer shares, being able to buy more and more new coins. That's correct. Can yeah. you can you explain that last part again? So, um, because you know, let's say uh, there are a, a million shares in the beginning, and now the coin uh, supply increases because more people want to use the currency, and then uh, let's say three hundred thousand of those coins are used uh, and destroyed um, to issue those new coins, now there's only 700,000 left, right? And so if, if continually the demand increases, more and more shares will be burned uh, to issue new coins, and uh, the number of shares would continue to decrease. Of course, that would also mean in a supply and demand way, if there's an auction, uh, it would become cheaper to buy um, coins in an auction. Yeah, okay. so uh, um, I think, like, one way to think about it is, uh, you know, think about stocks. You know, and when a when a company you know earns money in a quarter, it, it can um, it can pay out a dividend um, to the shareholders. You know, leaving the quantity of you know shares outstanding the same, or it can um, engage in a in a share buyback. Um, so instead of paying out a dividend, it uses those earnings to go on the open market and and buy back shares. Thus, decreasing the um, you know quantity of shares outstanding and increasing the percentage that um, of the remaining shareholders, the percentage of future you know earnings that uh, that the remaining shareholders have, and the and the and the senior shares are um, it's kind of like a stock that never pays a dividend but always you know um, uses share buybacks. Um, uh, the the economic logic is the same, you know, ignoring you know. Tax implications and things like that. The economic implications are exactly the same, whether you whether you buy back shares or whether you pay a dividend. Um, so it makes sense to think of the um, the, the senior shares as like a, as as like a dividend paying um, you know crypto equity, um, even though it doesn't really pay a dividend per se, um, uh, but it acts as if it does pay a dividend because of the this this auction logic. It's like a share. It's like a share buyback.
And and it's 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 important to think about it that way because once we think about it that way, then we have a way of valuing what those same rate shares should be. There'd be you know the the net present value of all expected future cash flows. Um, whereas if we think about it in terms of well, the same rate shares over time, um, uh, you know the supply decreases so they become more scarce. You know, it's just sort of muddled economic logic. You can't really figure out how we value something that becomes increasingly scarce. Um, but we don't have to. Um, uh, it's actually just like valuing a, um, a dividend-paying paying, um, security. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the really brilliant things about this is, and, and that was also a brilliant thing about Bitcoin, perhaps a sort of that, was that uh, it incentivized it incentivized uh, working on this and it really rewarded early adopters, right? So if you were there in 2009, 2010, uh, you know, working on this extremely speculative project that, you know, nobody knew if it was going to get to anything would then have any real value. But if you believed in it, you could work on it and it was easy to mine some Bitcoins or just purchase some Bitcoins. Uh, and, and you sort of knew if this works out, I'll become rich, right? So it, it made a lot of I don't think Bitcoin would have worked out otherwise. You know, I don't think uh, we would have ever ever gotten to the point where we are today without that. And so there is a sort of uh, idea, I guess, if you have a stable currency, then uh, that would fall away, right? You wouldn't have this incentivization of people anymore to work on it. Uh, but if you have this share share coin model, I think it sort of gets the best of both worlds because you still have that incentivization on the share side. But you don't muddle this up with uh, a volatile currency in the price. Um, so I think it's uh, absolutely brilliant. I, I, I well, really you, do think you, it, you, yeah. you get to you get to mo like the, the two different motivations. Um, you know, have their own um, uh, their own outlet. You know, so if your motivation is to have a stable, you know, coin, um, you buy the coin. The motivation is to speculate on the future adoption. You buy the shares, and they work together, kind of like this, you know, monetary, you know, yin and yang. You know, where they they support each other. You know, speculators buying the shares um, effectively create a um, like loss absorbing capital. You know, that they, they, they create a buffer for those periods when the coin supply needs to decrease in order to be stable. Um, uh, you know, they're they're the ones that are, you know, bearing the brunt, you know, of of those periods where coin supply needs to decrease to prop up the coin. Um, and you know, they're willing to do that because um, they, instead of coin uh, holders, are uh, will participate in the upside. You know, if if the if the coin turns out to be a success, then they'll make a lot of money by um, by having the shares. So it's kind of like transferring risk, you know, to to the party that um, you know most wants to bear it, um, and and everybody gets paid. And it, um, you know, it's it's a Pareto, you know, superior um, state of affairs than than the unicoin model. Um, uh, sorry, I'm I'm curious about sort of the practical use of this. Like, so in order to auction your your shares for coins and vice versa, how would one go about doing that? Is that done in a wallet, or is that some sort of centralized plat decentralized or centralized platform? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, you you need to make it um, part of the 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 protocol and the blockchain itself. So it'd be like a an on chain auction, and you know there there. Are, Different ways that that can be constructed. Um, it's a that's a problem in and of itself, you know, in order to to to, to solve. Um, but roughly, I'd see it working the following way. You know, the the you get the information from the outside world mm -hmm. according to whatever mechanism that you, that you use. Um, the um, so the protocol calculates how much um, the change in coin should be, and if it's an increase in coin. Um, then you have an auction uh, whereby um, anyone can um, trade shares for coin um, at, uh, at at whatever price the auction is at. So everyone would submit their you know their bids you know so many so many coins you know um, uh, for you know per share so the price basically um, they would you know, um, you know encrypt those those bids they get recorded on on a on a block. And then, in a subsequent block, um, you know, the everyone decrypts their, um, you know, their bids, and the protocol goes and calculates who gets filled and who doesn't. 
um, and uh, destroys the um, uh, you know the, the shares that are sold for coin, um, and then vice versa. The supply needs to to, to decrease. Um, so um, so it would actually be a, you know part of the protocol. The auction would have to be part of the protocol itself. Okay, and with regards to adoption, so we touched on this a bit earlier uh, on how you know the 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 the, the, the principles behind Bitcoin are slightly more, I guess, simple to understand. Uh, you know, you have a fixed money supply, and you know you can think about it. You know, one way to look at it is sort of like digital gold, even though that might not be empirically the case, but um, it's one close analogy. Now, with this, you're dealing with a mechanism that is somewhat more, I guess, you could say, complex for just regular people to comprehend. How do you anticipate that a coin like this could be adopted and potentially become mainstream? Uh, yeah, good question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's. Um, I, I think all of these things take time for people to, um, you know, uh, um, absorb how they work, um, and and you need experiments. You know, people need to um, uh, to 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 throw um, these. You know, stable coin ideas out there, and you know, see you know, see what works and what doesn't. Um, you know, there 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 are different ways of achieving the same end as well. Um, uh, the, the, there are a number of different types of stable coin um, uh, uh, you know um, schemes. You know, the 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 one that I like most, um, separate from the same year shares, is probably um, uh, Vitalik's. Um, uh, um, uh, shelling, shelling coin idea, uh, which uses a very different mechanism from um, from same year shares. It's more of like a CFD model, you know, where you have some underlying collateral, which is like the the, the you know the volatile coin, so it's the, the analog to to my shares, um, and you have a you know a, a a long and short CFD, and the guy who's on the long side of that is you know buying effectively buying the stable coin, and you use uh, like an interest rate mechanism to um, uh, to to clear the market to get supply and <coughs> and and demand uh, on both sides of the CFD to um, to, to to clear, and um, that's an interesting scheme as well. Uh, I I. It works in a different way. Um, uh, they each have their own problems and um, and benefits. Um, but you know, again, it remains to be seen how these things work when they're put into practice. I personally think the shares idea is actually easier to comprehend. Uh, so talking about understandability, which is an important part of adoption, um, I, I I think it's easier to comprehend than the other schemes I've seen out there. But um, you know, it remains to be seen. Um. So, uh, touching on uh, the topic of, of price information, right? So, in, in, in this model, in the senior shares model, you'd need uh, uh, the price information to determine how many uh, um, coins are going to be auctioned off. Is that correct? Yeah. So, um, it's interesting that you mentioned shelling coin as a different idea, right? Because uh, as sort of a shelling. Um, betting game is also one way of finding out the price in in the model in that you're describing, correct? Yeah. So I mean, both you know, shelling coin and and senior shares need some kind of mechanism for getting the market information into the protocol, and and one such mechanism is using um, some type of shelling game, you know, where you you know, incentivize people to um, uh, to uh, to submit their estimate of what you know the the random variable is, you know, so let, let's say whatever you're indexing the coin to, maybe it's the price of price of gold and the price of oil and some other things like it's a, an index, and uh, and you incentivize people to um, take their estimate of what that market information is and you submit it to uh, to the blockchain, um, and the you know the winners of that game are the people who bet with the majority. So you might say, you know, collect all of the estimates, and everyone whose estimate lies within the inter two quartiles um, wins, and everyone who's outside the you know the outer two quartiles they uh, you know they lose and pay the winners, 
and then you take the median of those inter two quartiles as the value you know that the the, the protocol uses or something like that. Um, uh, there are different mechanisms that you come up with, but the underlying assumption behind these uh, shelling games is that um, that the obvious the, you know, the, the, the obvious bet to make um, is that um, is the truth, you know, so that the shelling point is, um, is truth. And you know, whether that's a reasonable assumption or not um, is something that has to be tested. It certainly can't be um, proven by, you know, by economic logic because the, the incentive of the game is to bet the consensus. It's to bet what everybody else is going to bet. And uh, you know whether the truth is what you think everyone else will bet, or something else is, uh, um, you know, it's, it's an empirical question, I think. Right. And especially uh, it would be very dangerous, right, if you build a currency on that, and then maybe it holds for a long time, and then once billions of dollars are at stake, it breaks down. Uh, yeah. That would be quite disastrous. No. Yeah, I, I I agree, and 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 I, I I'm kind of skeptical of um, uh, these uh, shelling point. Schemes, um, but you know, I'd, I'd love to see them implemented and, and see how they actually work in in the wild. And they're not just you know the um, there there are a number of people working on uh, prediction market ideas that use shelling schemes as well. So it's not just the the stable currency motivation you know where these things come to play. And uh, you know, I'd I'd love to see how they actually work. Um, you know, there should be you know, I, I, I think it's great that people are are putting you know research into the space, but I just kind of feel it in my gut. There's something quite flaky and unstable, um, you know, about uh, um, about these ideas. But you know, it'd be really cool if I if I'm wrong, because because uh, it's it's a, it's a great solution. <laughs> it's a great solution if it, if it actually works. But I'm, I'm not so sure it, it it can. Now you mentioned research. Like you said, there there is a lot of research that is going into this space. We've seen multiple. Uh, um, Ideas uh, be submitted. So you mentioned also Vitalik uh, had an idea for, for and 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 an Italian gentleman. Uh, yeah, um, uh, Fernando Amatano. Right. So I mean, that we're certainly coming a long way from the the simple ideas of Bitcoin and stable uh, and uh, deterministic uh, supply. Um, where do you think this is going? Where do you think uh, this will go if stable coins do? Gain traction in five years, for for instance. Well, I think it's a, a, a prerequisite for a cryptocurrency to have to ever become a general medium of exchange. You know, the thing that you you know you buy your coffee for in, you know, in Starbucks. You know, um, I think we'll we'll need to have some kind of stable coin. I think we'll see um, uh, a lot of different experiments. Um, probably m most of them will fail, but um, I'm pretty bullish that you know. That that some will actually take off and 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 get a lot of traction, and and more traction than 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 Bitcoin has uh, um, has achieved. And in a way, um, you know, Bitcoin is sort of um, laying the groundwork because, you know, if you think of like merchant adoption, um, you know, for a currency, well, it's it's not you know if if you're already accepting one cryptocurrency, um, it's it's not hard to. Um, you know, for a payment provider to to support others. Um, so having the you know the you know things like merchant adoption for you know for Bitcoin actually makes it easier for a rival currency um, uh, to to plug into that to that network effect. And and I think a stable coin you know, um, you know will be the thing that people will actually start, start to use. So do you, do you think eventually this should be uh, its own currency, its own blockchain, uh, maybe its own proof of work or proof of stake, or do you think this could be implemented uh, as an Ethereum sub-currency, or do you perhaps even think it could be possible that Bitcoin could be changed uh, in such a way? Yeah, I, 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 I'm pretty skeptical of, of, um, of Bitcoin um, being the Bitcoin protocol being changed. Uh, I don't think there's any, um, there's really any, any, any impetus for that at all. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm I'm agnostic about it being, you know, implemented on top of another protocol or its own, you know, blockchain. Um, you know, I'd like to see see both. And I think what we find most likely to happen is that, um, you know, people are experimenting with different types of um, you know consensus algorithms um, you know uh, you know different types of proof of work um, different 
types of proof of stake and um, even entirely different um, uh, um, consensus algorithms, uh, you know, coming from the Byzantine fault tolerance, um, uh, um, you know, line of research, and uh, and I think some of these, you know, these these different consensus algorithms will also experiment with uh, with different coin supply um, algorithms and and stable coin. Um, you know, there's there's a project called um, Pebble um, uh, uh, by uh, uh, started by Dominic Williams. Um, which is a, a stablecoin um, uh, cryptocurrency uh, based on um, uh, a consensus algorithm that's um, th that's neither proof of work nor proof of stake, um, and it's a pretty serious, um, pretty serious project, and that's an example of uh, you know of of how I, I see the stablecoin thing taking off. Um, you know, it's not just experimenting with different types of uh, crypto monetary policy, but also different types of, of, of consensus. Uh, but touching I'm, on... I'm, sorry, but I'm not talking about it, um, you, know, uh, you know, about uh, um, uh, stablecoins being, you know, run on something like Ethereum or running on their own blockchains. You know, uh, I'd, I'd like to see both. Now, are, are you agnostic to the success of Bitcoin? I mean, you mentioned... Uh, your skepticism of Bitcoin. I mean, it, it is it does come up a lot in this uh, discussion that uh, which crypto cryptocurrency will prevail will be Bitcoin, will be others. We've got this idea of Bitcoin maximal maximalism. Uh, I, I think. I mean, is it is it necessary for Bitcoin to succeed, or are we just biased because we hold it and we? So, so I, I, I I I don't think it's necessary for Bitcoin to succeed. Um, I think if a, another cryptocurrency um, it takes off, or multiple cryptocurrencies take off and really get you know oh, find the, find powerful use cases and get adoption, um, I think that's probably good for Bitcoin um, rather than rather than detrimental. Um, you know what what's what's missing is an ecosystem of of cryptocurrencies that have, uh, you know, um, widespread, powerful use cases, and and I, I think the volatility of Bitcoin makes it harder to find those use cases. And if and if some other cryptocurrencies do, um, you know, Bitcoin will still plug into that that ecosystem, serving some function. I don't know exactly what you know it would be. Maybe some kind of crypto collateral or or. Or whatever, um, but um, I, I think Bitcoin will 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 thrive if if, if other cryptocurrencies thrive. The, the the biggest risk to the space, I think, is the reliance too much on the success of of, of one particular cryptocurrency. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think that's I think that's a, a mistake on so many so many different levels. Now we mentioned monetary policy quite a bit just before we wrap up here. Uh, now the the idea of monetary policy can be seen by some as uh, undesirable uh, because it is so so associated to the idea of a central bank and central you know government policy. Um, now you wrote in your paper uh, this kind of struck me as interesting is in a sense this dual model of coins and shares embodies the functionality of a fiat central uh, bank without the centralization. For can can you just you know. In, in simple terms, uh, explain like what are the different components of a monetary policy, and what what I'm interested in is how can we take those components, but that are run by man, and you know de decentralize them or turn in turn them into an algorithm. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, I think um, you know what I mean by monetary policy is really just um, uh, changing. The, the money supply to achieve some objective, uh, and and in this case, it's um, you know it's some price stability um, defined in some way, and and that is pretty much what cent what, what what central banks do. Uh, um, uh, the 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 mechanism by which that's achieved, um, you know, ch has changed over time. Um, you know, it used to be that money supply was targeted directly. Um, uh, over the last uh, um, couple of decades, uh, you know, the, the the mechanism has been targeting the short-term interest rate, um, uh, but they're they're all geared to the same end, which is changing the money supply in order to um, uh, you know to achieve price stability, and that's not a bad thing. The, the the bad thing about it is you know is the is the discretionary nature of it, um, and there is a debate, you know, um, a long-running debate within. Monetary economics of you know rules versus discretion um, you know and uh, the 
you know, central banks are run on a very discretionary basis uh, today, but there, you know, is a powerful minority of um, uh, um, uh, economists who argue that it should be entirely rule-driven. You know, so you, you know, you get rid of the, you know, the, the FOMC, get rid of the, the the central bankers, and and that's the monetary policy with the computer. And I think that's um, uh, I'm obviously of the latter opinion. Uh, and I think that what we have with cryptocurrency is not not only can we replace monetary policy with a computer, but we can replace it with a distributed computer. Um, so you know, there's no trusted third party to to actually implement the needed to implement the monetary policy itself. And I think that's a really evocative um, and an interesting idea. Yeah, so, well, right, well, why don't we just uh, you know, decentral, uh, also replace politicians with a decentralized computer? I think that's a great idea, too. <laughs> um, so, I know, I think in the U.S., right, the, I mean, price price stability is, is one objective that central banks have, but I think another one is unemployment, at least in the U.S. Um, do you also see uh, other cryptocurrencies, do you think that could be in the future uh, a role as well? That something like that is taking account, or maybe uh, completely different things. No, right, something like a like a full employment um, mandate. For no, I, I I don't think so. I I think really the only the only um, the only thing that makes sense uh, is price stability. Okay. And it, it, yeah, I, I think that's the only thing that makes sense to me. So. Um, Kind of as a last topic, and, and it's, it's interesting to have you on, especially with your background. Uh, can you give us some insights into how do central bankers think about Bitcoin? Is this a topic they care about? Um, I, I mean, there have been some sort of official publications. Uh, I've read some of them. Where we've read some of them. There are, you know, I mean, one definitely gets some impression. But I, I don't know. Do you have any insights or impression? Um, what the sort of view is there, and can we expect any actions to come in the next years? Yeah, I mean, okay, I think there is, um, uh, first of all, uh, you know, cryptocurrency, you know, to, to most people in the financial industry just means Bitcoin, because, you know, they, they, they read about it in the paper, but not look into it any further. Um, and yeah, the the opinion is 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 one of um, I'd say almost almost universal skepticism, and there there are some exceptions uh, um, to that, and some people who've bothered to actually look into it, um, you know, in in some detail, and I think you get people who fall basically into two camps. You get uh, you know one camp that thinks, uh, okay, this cryptocurrency idea is um, you know uh, is 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 really interesting, but um, Bitcoin won't work for largely a lot of the reasons we've been talking about today. Um, and those are people who are actually quite susceptible to, the, um, uh, to, to this idea of decentralized monetary policy and, and, and stable coin. And then you get the other, you know, the, the other group of people who are like, well, the cryptocurrency thing, um, you know, that, that's, that's a bit stupid, but, um, uh, but the underlying blockchain technology is, is interesting because uh, it, it, it can solve some you know, really big problems in um, you know, around payments and and security settlements, and uh, um, and I and I think that's that's the that's where if you talk to most people in finance who 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 won't laugh um, when you talk about blockchain and cryptocurrency, um, that's what they want to talk about. They want to talk about using um, uh, the distributed technology for um, for settlements, um, but but not interested in the currency. It's interesting that there wasn't a group there that they were like, uh, yes, we understand Bitcoin, cryptocurrency is interesting, and, and Bitcoin is, is great, right? <laughs> I've never met anyone like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying they don't, they, they, they don't exist, but, um, but, but no, I, I don't think it's... They're uh, rare species. Yeah, I don't think it's, it's, taken, it's taken very seriously, um, uh, rightly or wrongly. Uh, I mean, I think... I think wrongly, obviously, that, that you know, cryptocurrency should be um, taken seriously, um, and and it's probably taken more seriously today than it was even six months ago. Uh, but again, it's the the, the real interest, um, and and it's quite serious interest, um, is is in using the technology to solve problems and settlements um, rather than the currency. And if I were to make a bet, I would say that this that's where we're actually going to find the first you know big powerful use case will be 
um, you know, using the underlying technology, uh, you know, rather than the cryptocurrency. And I think the cryptocurrency, you know, I think it's still really early days, and um, you know, I think that will flourish probably after um, we've seen a widespread use case of the technology for something something else. Is my personal speculation. Um, last week we talked, uh, or Sebastian mentioned one thing that uh, uh, sort of has been an idea. I wonder to what extent you agree with that. It's, it's the idea that uh, uh, macroeconomic events, like let's say a financial crisis, could play a significant role in, in facilitating uh, the adoption of cryptocurrencies. Do, do you think that's a likely scenario? Yeah, I mean, maybe. Um, I think it will actually probably accelerate the adoption of, again, the, the, the technology um, uh, for things like security settlements. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think the, the, like the, the financial crisis did help, um, you know, with the adoption of Bitcoin, um, but just skepticism about banks and, you know, it was like a vote of, you know, um, uh, you know a vote against the, the, the legacy financial system. but. Um, but also, interest rates are, are an important part of that story. I mean, basically, in anything, any asset that that um, that 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 seems cool and popular at the time, but doesn't earn any income, is is more attractive in an environment where we, where interest rates are at zero. You know, whereas if interest rates were at five percent, uh, you know, the opportunity cost of holding Bitcoin or gold or or, or whatever is uh, um, you know, it's a lot higher. Um, so you, you always see, you know, these these types of uh, you know commodity-like assets um, are more popular, um, you know, after financial crisis or deep recession and, and interest rates get slashed. And it, you know, it's it's quite possible that we could go into a scenario where you know uh, most people in the Bitcoin world won't believe this because they always think that we're on the you know the brink of uh, Weimar Republic. But um, you know, we could go into a scenario where deflation becomes. A real issue again, and central banks um, have to move to a regime of, of, of negative interest rates. You know, which has a lot of weird implications. You know, actually, uh, you know, being charged money to hold, you know, being, being charged a fee to hold your money in a bank, um, you know, would certainly encourage the adoption of uh, cryptocurrencies and 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 and, uh, and other weird stuff. So uh, I, I I I do think that like the macro. Backdrop does 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 influence it, um, but probably for different reasons from what most people think. So, can we talk about um, some of the projects you've been personally involved in? Uh, sure. Uh, there there are several companies <laughs> that that you've been uh, working with. Yeah, the the priority at the moment is um, a startup called ZeroClear, uh, and it's um, it's a solution for um, in the clearing and settlement space, um, the initial use case that we're targeting is um, using a a, um, a Turing blockchain to, um, uh, to to implement the clearing of OTC uh, derivatives contracts. And a certain subset of the OTC derivative contract market that we're uh, that we're going after, and it's um, uh, you know the, the the technology is is ideally suited to solve. Um, some really hard problems in uh, you know, the infrastructure side of, uh, of, of, of derivative settlements, and they're, they're problems that are are more acute now than they've been ever been in the past because of well the financial crisis and uh, lots of regulatory you know, you know changes that um, have taken place afterwards, uh, and it's a it, it's an area that's already in flux. You know, within the financial industry, um, uh, and 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 no one has come up with um, uh, you know with a you know solution in the space that we're looking at. Um, so it's a it's a problem to be solved, and and, and we have a, a solution toward it. Uh, you know, to, for for the for the problem that's very unconventional because it's based on blockchain technology, um, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and, and so, is this interest rate derivatives or some? I mean, I. I take it you're, you're talking about derivatives in the, the traditional uh, financial sector. Yeah, yeah so um, it won't be exclusive to interest rate derivatives, and it's, it still remains to be seen, you know, um, which contracts we will, um, you know, focus on initially. Uh, but uh, the the space are the space is bilateral OTC derivatives contracts, so there are. Um, 
you know, the, the regulatory changes that have happened um, since 2008 um, have been trying to push this market to something called centrally cleared um, contracts, where where a where a clearinghouse stands between buyer and seller um, of the derivative contract. And the market that we're focused on is the subset of derivatives contracts that won't be eligible for central clearing, that will remain bilaterally cleared. And, uh, and, and these are the, you know, the, the more complicated contracts, the less liquid ones. Um, you know, a lot of them are in the interest rate space, but, um, but, but, but not exclusively. And so where is that at right now? You're, you're launching soon? Uh, yeah, it's 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 very early stage. Uh, we're we're okay. in the middle of a seed funding round at the moment. So uh, after that, um, uh, we we close that, then uh, we'll 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 go public with more detail on how it all works. Okay. Cool. Well, I, I definitely recommend that uh, people read the the white paper that you wrote. Uh, can you tell us where we can find that? Uh, oh yeah, it's on. Um, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, We'll put the link in the show notes and I think it's I think it's GitHub RM Sam's backslash stable coins. Okay. And uh, there's also your blog, right? So you have written quite a few blog posts, uh, and that's uh, cryptonomics uh, with uh, with C uh, in the beginning. And we will also put that it's cryptonomics.com, right? Uh, but we will we'll put that yeah. link in the show notes as well. Okay. Yeah. No thanks. It's uh, I think it's I think it's .org. Cryptonomics.org. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Uh, well, Robert, thanks so much for joining us today. It was uh, really interesting to talk with you about this topic. I think it's uh, such a such an important topic, and uh, you've really found a, a really an, a nice, elegant solution to this. I think. Uh, let's hope someone, some people will find a, a nice, elegant solution to the other problem that I found in the price, and then hopefully we'll see some nice, elegant imp uh, implementations of this to, yeah. to see whether this will actually work out and whether this can actually sort of realize the vision and the goal that we all see in the future of a decentralized currency and, and cryptocurrency. Yeah, no, I, I think it's it's very early days. Um, solutions out there um, and you know one, one of them will take off um, but it's just encouraging that you know more more people are looking at the at the space and thinking hard about it absolutely well thanks so much again and uh, so we will be back next week we have uh, another interesting episode coming up with uh, Preston Dern and uh, Sean Jones uh, so we will be talking about uh, Preston's uh, new project called Eries Industries um, and so uh, Preston's been, uh, Sean has, has done an interview with Preston before on our podcast, which was super interesting, and I remember talking with him in Amsterdam too, so it's, I really look forward to that one too. Um, if you want to support the show, uh, you can do so, you know, follow us on Twitter, Epicenter BTC, and uh, leave an iTunes review for us that really helps new people uh, find the show. You can, uh, you know, let us know what we're doing well and what we can still improve. And uh, we would and we really appreciate that. And of course, also subscribe to our newsletter at epsonbitcoin.com slash newsletter. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel at yes, right. youtube.com slash epicenterbtc, where you'll find all our hangouts and videos. Absolutely. Okay, well, thanks for listening, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>